So yeah, this is to do with um, trustee roles and responsibilities. CICs, if you're a CIC, it's a slightly different situation because you don't legally have trustees with a CIC. You have a management committee, normally directors, and the legal requirements of being, uh, of being a trustee do not apply um, to being a CIC. So if anyone was a CIC, it's just different regulatory requirement. Yeah, so in the session, I'm just going to look at things like overall responsibilities of being a trustee, different ways trustees can contribute to their organisation, the important role of the trustees in the governance of charities. So the Charity Commission defines um, or says the, ultimately, the ultimate responsibility for directing the charity, ensuring that it is solvent, well run, and delivering charitable outcomes for the benefit of the public for which it is set up. So quite a lot of responsibility lies with trustees in, in ensuring that the charity is, remains financially solvent, that it's able to have enough money to deliver its services for the next financial year, um, is well run, um, and delivering the outcome that you said you, you will, will in your charitable objects. Obviously, over the past few years, there's been more public scrutiny of charities. Um, the media has been seeing things like charity, um, think, or supposedly high charity, high salaries for large charity bosses, um, how they use data. A lot of this affects the national charities as opposed to the smaller charities, but it means that the Charity Commission has become slightly more concerned about how trustees are, are trying to avoid scandal, really. Um, so it's become more of a sort of regulator as opposed to a kind of a supporter. So, yeah, the Charity Commission became more, more strict in its regulation. A regulator that is becoming more proactive and decisive in deterring, preventing and responding to abuse and mismanagement in charities, um, ensuring the integrity of the register of charities and trying to help charities to run their I was trying to help trustees to run their charities effectively. That's from the forward to the Charity Commission annual report from 2015. Um, so the Charity Commission has got new powers. So it's now issuing official warnings, um, removing trustees or employees for mismanagement and misconduct, um, disqualifying individuals from trusteeships, extending the list of convictions which lead to automatic disqualifications of trustee. So I'll come on to those a bit later on about what convictions apply. Um, so the Charity Commission is now issuing uh, warnings where there's been a breach of trust or duty or other misconduct or mismanagement. Example there of how they gave a warning to the Iris uh, PCA. I think that was over excessive um, payments to the chief exec. So first of all, getting started as a charity trustee, first things to consider, is someone eligible? So there are a list of convictions uh, which would disqualify someone from being a trustee. Was the process to appoint them correct? Does the trustee understand the constitution? Um, disclosing conflicts of interest. Key, part, key issue of being a trustee. Um, also, having an effective induction. Um, it's a good idea to have effective induction processes in place so when someone does become a new trustee, they fully understand the organisation, what it does, what their responsibilities are. So the Charity Commission um, had made a comment about trustee responsibilities. We will respect and protect charities' independence. Under law, trustees must manage their own charities so long as they are within the law and in accordance with charity government documents. Uh, trustees have a broad discretion to act as they think fit, and that's in acting in the best interests of um, the charity for which they are um, a trustee. However, there is um, a section in the 
CC3 Charity, Charity Commission guidance, I'll just have a link, um, a link to that later on, where there, there is, a, is a bit more pres prescriptive um, and saying that failure to follow best practice uh, may be a breach of trust. But generally speaking, I think the, the, the threshold to be getting in trouble with the trustee is, is quite high. Um, so a key thing to bear in mind with being a trustee is that it relates to governance, not management. It's quite, I mean, it's, it's easier definition, I think, when you have large organisations and you have a clear distinction between who the staff are and who the trustees are. Um, it becomes slightly more complicated when you have this very small organisation, perhaps where everybody's a volunteer. But the key thing to bear in mind is that the trustee role is about governance. So it's things like approving mission, policy, strategy, reviewing risk, appointing and overseeing direct chief executive, structuring the governance process, providing insight, wisdom and judgment, monitoring performance. Whereas management, which is, um, yeah, if you have paid staff would be what your paid staff would be implementing. It's about actioning policy and strategy, delivering services, uh, appointing managers and staff, supporting the governance process, implementing board decisions, measuring performance. So governance is not about day-to-day -day operations, it's about longer-term oversight, making sure the organisation is working towards its goals, like I said, remains financially um, viable. So there's the Charity Commission has lots of good documents you can uh, available on the internet. Um, I'll send you this link as well afterwards. So the essential trustee, um, what you need to know, what you need to do. Um, very good read. So I'll send you um, a link to that. Basically, um, outlines trustee duties. So ensure your ensure your charity is carrying out its purposes for the public benefit. Comply with your governing document and the law. Act in the charity's best interests. Manage your charity's resources responsibly. Act with reasonable care and skill. Ensure your charity is accountable. So it's got some examples here uh, in terms of what it means by ensure your charity is carrying out its purposes for the public benefit. Um, so basically you should, the organis organization should be doing, <coughs> uh, carrying out the purposes which are in its governing document. Um, so understand the charity's purposes. Like I said, we should be in the constitution. Plan what your charity will do. Explain how charity's activities further its purposes. So you've got your, broadly speaking, your aims as your kind of charitable purposes. So you need to think about well, what, the, what the activities are going to be. Are you going to meet those aims? Understand how the charity benefits the public. So in terms of being a charity, not only do you have your charitable purposes, um, you also have to meet the public benefit test. So you have to be benefiting uh, a sufficient section of the wider public. Um, yeah, and in terms of, you can get something called sort of organizational or mission drift where the charity starts off doing one thing, which is in its purposes, but over time it starts doing other things. So for example, I don't know, maybe maybe it was um, set up to work with um, young people and every time it starts working with older people, if it's not in its purposes, then the purposes need to be amended. So you need to work within um, what your charitable purposes are in the constitution. So that's another thing to bear in mind that you might need to review the constitution periodic points I think we even CVS have done it on a sort of every 10 years or so <clears throat> so that's another thing to bear in mind in terms of um, 
and mm. making sure the charity's purposes are in line with what the organization is currently doing because there needs to be a match up. Um, comply with your charity's governing document and the law. Um, yeah, like I said, so make sure the charity complies with the governing documents. So your constitution is basically like your rule book. Um, so it should have all everything in there you need to understand and able to run the organization. So things like how many board meetings, process for recruiting trustees, how many minimum trust, minimum trustees, maximum trustees, term limits, um, what to do if there's a conflict of interest, all these kind of things should be in your constitution. Um, so also they're expecting you trustees to things like read relevant guidance, take appropriate advice. Um, registered charities must keep their details on the register up to date and send the right financial information. So if you are a registered charity, you have a, your details are on the Charity Commission website. Uh, you need to keep that up to date. Uh, you need to send the right financial information to the accounts every year. I think you also need to do your, um, oh, I forget what it's called now, but you have to update your details every year on the, on the Charity Commission website as well. Also trustees change you have a certain period of number of days, which I think you're supposed to inform. If a trustee resigns or a new trustee is appointed, you're supposed to keep um, update the register, I think within 14 days. Um, so that's something else to bear in mind. As a trustee, you must act in your charity's best interests. So that means deciding what will best enable the charity to carry out its purposes. Um, Trustee must make balanced and informed decisions about the long term as well as the short term. Um, avoid conflicts of interest. So where your duty to your charity conflict conflicts with your personal interests or loyalty to another organization. So it's quite common for trustees to be, or people to be trustees on more than one organization. Um, so if there's a situation where there's a relationship between those organizations, obviously um, that could potentially be a conflict of interest. So an example might be if a, if a charity, one charity, if a person is a trustee on two charities and there's a possible example um, process of giving a grant on there between one charity and another, um, or one charity paying another charity for a piece of work or something like that, Obviously, the person would have to make that clear about the conflict of interest and might have to sit out of that decision making process. Um, and it should be in your constitution what the process should be. It's also good practice for, for example, at the start of board meetings, trust have a, have a section item about potential conflicts of interest so trustees can declare any conflict of interest. Also, things have like having maybe once a year a conflict of interest form, getting trustees to update that um, so that it's on file, so that you are aware of any potential conflicts of interest should they arise. I think the key thing is just to, for trustees to be clear, they're on the side of safety, make it clear if where possible conflicts of interest could arise, and if they do make it clear that they're not part of that decision-making um, process. Trustees should also not receive any benefit from the charity, unless it's properly authorized and is clearly in the charity's interests. So being a trustee is a voluntary position. It's not something you get paid for, unlike with the CIC where you don't have that clear distinction between un with unpaid trustees. With some constitutions, certainly with the CIO template constitution, it has um, a section in there about trustees being paid for work that is not for being a trustee so for example if you had a trustee who was an IT expert and you wanted to pay them to build a website for the charity of which they're a trustee um, if you have the correct provisions in your constitution the trustee would be able to be paid for their expertise in being an IT expert and building a website but they'd be paid for that they wouldn't be paid for being a trustee so it has to be clear that the, a trustee can never receive um, payments or benefits for being a trustee. It has to be for doing something else. And the provisions should be in your, um, there should be provisions in your constitution to um, allow that. And obviously the trustee would not be able to be make, um, 
the trustee who was going to be, shall I go back to my example with the IT expert, the trustee who was an IT expert would not be able to take be taking part in the decision making process by the board to approve them to build a website, for example, because um, that would be a clear conflict of interest. Um, so trustees, um, as a trustee, you must manage your charity's resources responsibly. So you must act responsibly, reasonably and honestly. Um, trustees must make sure the charity's assets are only used to support or carry out its charitable purposes, like I said, as defined in the Constitution. Um, trustees must not take inappropriate risks with the charity's assets or reputation. Um, yeah, the Charity Commission has become very concerned about reputation because of what's happened in the media um, with scandals um, over recent years. Uh, trustees must not overcommit the charity. Uh, trustees must take special care when investing or borrowing um, and also comply with any restrictions on, on spending funds. Trustees must also act with reasonable care and skill. Um, so you must use reasonable care and skill, making use of your skills and experience and taking appropriate advice when necessary. Um, trustees should have enough time, thought and energy to your role. For example, by preparing for attending and actively participating in all trustees meetings. So I think it is a common problem where people sign up to be trustees and then they don't come to any meetings for a long period of time. So you might also have a provision in your constitution in terms of, well, if someone doesn't attend a meeting for six months, they receive a warning if they carry on it might be uh, removed because obviously I think sometimes people want to be a trustee because they want to put it on their CV, they think it looks good, but they're not perhaps willing to put in the effort. It does take up time. You know, you, you might only have six board meetings a year, but you have lots of paperwork, which you should be read, which trustees need to read um, to make, be on top of, or well, to be able to make informed decisions at the board meetings. Um, and to be really understand the organisation, really understand the charity, how it operates, what it does, because ultimately liability um, lies with the trustees in terms of the organisation being able to function. Um, trustees must also ensure the charity is accountable. So you must comply with statutory accounting and reporting requirements. Um, you also need to be able to demonstrate your charity is complying with the law, is well run and effective. Ensure appropriate accountability to members if your charity has a membership separate from trustees. So this depends on your constitution. Some constitutions, like I say, there is a wider membership. So the CIO structure, for example, has two different types of constitution. One with a wider membership, one where the trustees are the members. Um, so obviously it's slightly more straightforward if the trustees are the members. Um, if you do have a wider membership, quite often that's why there's things like an AGM. <clears throat> so if you had a wider membership, you might want to say certain key decisions you report. For example, like the accounts are approved by members at the AGM. Or if you had, um, you might have a constitution where trustees have to be, a certain number of trustees, for example, are elected from the members. So at the AGM, you might have those trustees elected, for example. Uh, trustees also have to ensure accountability within the charity, particularly where you delegate responsibility um, for particular tasks or decisions to staff or volunteers. Like I said, so all these things are in the booklet, which I'll send you a link to. Um, making decisions as a trustee, Decisions don't normally have to be unanimous. It can just be a majority of trustees. So this is where it becomes um, important, right, in terms of normally um, there's, there would be a requirement, I think, under the Charity Commission to have at least three trustees, because obviously that way you're always going to have a majority uh, able to make a decision. Um, then it depends on... <clears throat> what your minimum number of trustees is to be quorum. 
to make the uh, to make the meeting valid. Um, you know, because if you had two trustees, then it'd be quite difficult if both you wouldn't be able to get a unanimous decision if both trustee or trustees disagreed. Um, so bear that in mind in terms of what your constitution says, in terms of the minimum number of the quorums, or a quorum, how many trustees must be there at a meeting to make it um, uh, yeah, quorum and legally um, acceptable. So trust as a trustee, you must act within the powers. And so the powers is um, what your um, organization can do in its constitution. You must act in good faith and only in the interest of your charity. So again, that's where that potential, be aware of that conflict of interest potential in terms of um, if someone's a trustee with more than one organization, because they have to be, as a trustee, they must act in the, in the interests of that charity for which they are a trustee. So, so be aware of that as a potential conflict of interest. Trustees have to make sure they are sufficiently informed. So read, they need to read all the paperwork for the board meetings. Also be aware of their you know, legal obligations um, as, in, as it defined in the documents I'm talking about today. Um, you know, take account of all relevant factors ignore irrelevant factors. As I've mentioned, make sure you have proper processes to deal with potential conflicts of interest. Uh, make decisions that are within the range of decisions that a reasonable trustee could make in the circumstances. So yeah, in law, there's reasonable is a common, it's a really common word. Um, I suppose it kind of means what, what would be a reasonable decision in, in the circumstances in which someone would find themselves. Um, you should record how you made more significant decisions in case you need to review or explain in the future. So that's with the key thing with making minutes. So you have accurate minutes of your board meetings, which you keep um, in case you know you need to explain in future, be it an order to looking at them or some other reason. But it's a good idea. I forget what the actual how many years you need to keep. Um, minutes might be somewhere but yeah certainly for a number of years be a good safe practice to keep and obviously you don't have to keep physical copies you can keep um, copies online and safe as a word as a word file somewhere um <clears throat> so safeguarding has become an increasing issue over the recent years um, if you are a trustee of a charity that provides regulated activity for children or adults, you should expect your charity to request an enhanced um, DBS on, on you as a trust, potential trustee. Um, the Charity Commission is now saying safeguarding should be a key governance priority for trustees. Uh, it's essential that trustees know their responsibilities and have adequate measures in place to assess and address safeguarding risks. Um, so you should have adequate safeguarding policies and procedures appropriate for the charity's particular circumstances and which reflect both the law and best practice, uh, which are effectively implemented and reviewed. You should provide a safe and trusted environment which safeguards anyone who comes into contact um, with the organization, including beneficiary staff and volunteers. Trustees should set an organizational culture that prioritizes safeguarding so that it is safe for those affected to come forward and report incidents and concerns with the assurance they will be handled sensitively and properly. This is these. Um, this is all from the Charity Commission Revised Safeguarding Strategy and Regulatory Alert, December 2017. If you need any more support in terms of safeguarding your organisation, get in contact with either you can have a CVS, get in contact with us, we can, we can give you more support, particularly relating to safeguarding and how it affects um, or how your safeguarding, uh, things like your safeguarding policy. So your safeguarding policy should be updated on an annual basis. And it should have all the processes in place, um, the key processes in place, which 
um, trustees need to know about, or everybody in the organization needs to know about in terms of how safeguarding issues are uh, dealt with. Um, another thing to think about as a trustee is serious incident reporting. Um, the Charity Commission requires charities to report serious incidents. Um, you need to report what happened and you need to let the Charity Commission know that you are dealing with it. So what is, how is a serious incident defined? So it's defined as an adverse event, actual or alleged. So that's where the things like if it's in the media becomes an issue, which results in or risks significant harm to your charities, beneficiaries, staff, um, volunteers or others who come into contact with your charity through its work, loss of your charity's money or assets, damage to your charity's property, um, or harm to your charity's work or reputation. Um, so other examples of what could be reportable, things like um, cyber fraud, bogus online fundraising, for example, if it was a bogus online fundraising scheme in your organization's name. The resignation of the chairman of the board, and one or two trustees over differences of opinion, um, attempted fraud, uh, data protection breach, which should be also be reported to the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, things like spate of thefts of mobile phones in the office. Um, so you should have a serious incident reporting procedure, perhaps in your policy. Um, so considerations if something serious occurs. Who should you form? Who should you inform internally? Um, as I said, what policies and procedures need to be followed? So that's pretty another important. We can also support you in terms of getting your policies and procedures as an organization um, in, in order. Can the charity deal with this situation immediately? Uh, if not, what steps can be taken to minimize the impact? Consider obtaining advice. Um, for instance, legal or accounting advice. Um, as I said, you might need to file a serious incident report with the Charity Commission. If, you mean, if there's always, if you aren't sure, you can always get in touch with the Charity Commission and say, is it, do, they, do you think you need to report a serious incident report? Um, so as I think I said before, it, you would normally lead at least three unrelated trustees. This is more, particularly this is a, a, a requirement of grant funders. Um, grant funders, um, they like to see three unrelated, it will quite often be an eligibility criteria saying you must have three unrelated trustees. I think this is the idea that if they're unrelated, they're gonna be not gonna sort of act, um, be influenced by each other perhaps as easily as if they were related. Think about, if you are recruiting trustees, you need to think about what skills and experience you're looking for. So you might do something like a skills audit of your existing trustees, see what skills your existing trustees have, what areas you need um, a week, um, and then you can identify what kind of trustees you're looking for, which we can always help you with with that volunteer centre. Um, we can help you recruit either, you know, either through the volunteer centre or just if you have a general advert, we can, we can put it in our e-news our website. Um, trustees must be at least 16 years of old, 16 years old to be uh, a trustee of a CIO or a charitable company, but 18 for other sorts of charities. I mean, it's unlikely you're going to be getting trustees that young, but there is a slight difference in terms of law with between um, charitable companies, CIO, CIOs, and other sorts of charity. Um, so disqualified trustees, people cannot act as a trustee if they are disqualified, um, unless they are given a waiver by the Charity Commission. Now there is gonna be a table, I think, boy, there's a link to a table at the bottom of the slide. Um, 
which has information about reasons for disqualification. So things like being bankrupt, if this is undischarged. So I think that relates to how many years ago um, they were filed for bankrupt. Um, or having an individual voluntary arrangement, having an unspent conviction for certain offences, uh, including any that involve dishonesty or deception. So, yeah, I think spent means after a certain number of years, that person was convicted of an offence with certain offences that is considered discharged. So you need to check if someone does have an offence, what offence it was, how long ago it was, whether it's spent or not, if it relates to, I think, dishonesty, deception. I'll see if I can um, get a link to the table just to show you. So this is the link to the table you can go to, the link on the slide. And it goes through different um, fences, what legislation applies. So you might need to think about background checks on potential trustees. So check with the Charities Commission, Companies House, Disclosure and Barring Service, Individual Insolvency Regulator. Um, be clear what the process is for appointing trustees. Like I said, it should be in the Constitution, in your governing document. It's a good idea to create model trustee role descriptions for being a board member, um, being a chair, treasurer, secretary. Um, if you don't have any need, any get in touch with us. We can supply you them. It's 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 good because you can, you can give the, the that you can give the person who's going to be trustee this description at the beginning, so they know well this is what's required of me. Also useful in terms of you wanting to advertise, to recruit a new trustee that you have a clear, you can put, have a clear specification of, of what they'll be doing. Obviously things like the chair would be the most important role. Um, yeah, so the trustee role description. I think this is just an example. Um, what you might have in there, what you'd be expected of the, of the, um, the new trustee. So for example, if you're gonna have a chair, chair is a very key role. Um, they'd be, have a role in running the meetings, planning the agenda, perhaps sending out the papers before the meeting as well. Um, the chair might be representing the organization at external meetings, external events. As the person, as the chair is running the meeting, they need to be very aware of what the rules are, for how meetings are conducted. Um, if you had to have key decisions made between board meetings, um, the chair might be involved in making key decisions. So that's more responsibility in that respect as well. The treasurer, so this, the treasurer's main role is to ensure the financial viability of the charity, um, to ensure that proper financial records and procedures are maintained, um, to make sure there are proper reliable systems for budgeting, financial control and reporting, make sure that financial reports are regularly presented, 
So that will be a key part of any trustee board meeting will be the financial updates to make sure the uh, organization is staying on track. So typically you might have a budget for the financial year and then you know the key part of board meetings is maintaining that or is seeing how the budget, how the actual spend of the organization, expenditure of the organization and income matches with the budget, which is the predicted kind of the budget's like your kind of prediction for the year what your income expense is going to be. So if there is a severe difference, um, what's called variance between what the budget was expected to show and what's actually happening, then that would be alert. Uh, that should alert the trustees. So yeah, financial information is a key part of being trustee. And obviously the treasurer as a financial person has the largest uh, role in this area. So you might hope, you know, as a trustee, when you are recruiting a treasurer, like, you know, you'd be looking for someone with financial experience, perhaps ideally some, someone with a financial background, um, accounting or something. Obviously, it's quite difficult because there is, um, I think, that's something that the whole sector needs, or the, there is a shortage of trustees with those kind of skills. Obviously, we can try and help you recruit them if you, if you are looking for that type of person. As I said, to make treasurer's role, make sure that financial reports are regularly presented. And in small charities without paid staff, the treasurer might take a greater role in the day-to-day -day finances um, of the organization. The secretary, their role might be taking minutes, dealing with correspondence, um, things like arranging events, check that a quorum is, quorum is present, so taking the minutes, circulating minutes to the trustees. As I've already talked about, declaration of interest is a key point. Uh, a conflict of interest is any situation in which a trustee's personal interests or loyalties could or could be seen to prevent them from making a decision only in the best interests of the charity. It's recommended practice <clears throat> that if conflicts of interest arise in the course of their trusteeship, trustees should declare their interests and retire from the decision-making process. And we've already covered this. Um, this is made much easier if there is a register of interest to refer to. So as I said, um, quite a good idea to have a register of interest or you know, ask trustees on an annual basis, keep it up to date what their interests are to identify potential conflicts of interest. Um, next section, trustee expenses and payments. As I said earlier, trustees are volunteers. Um, you can pay trustees reasonable expenses that will be incurred such as travel and childcare, but a charity trustee may only be paid for, ser for serving as a trustee um, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I'm not quite sure where this came from, but I think you have to assume generally trustees cannot be paid um, for being trustees. You know, you, you would need to have specific permission from the charity commission for that to occur. So I think as a general rule, just, just bear that in mind. Um, expenses, uh, you can pay trustees expenses. They can be paid for specific items of work, like I said, um, as long as there's provision in that, um, in your constitution governing document, and they don't take part in the decision making process. Um, as well as what I've talked about so far, which has been charity commission guidance, there is also something called the charity governance code. Now the code sets the principles and recommended practice for good governance um, and is deliberately aspirational. Some elements of the code will be a stretch for many charities to achieve. Um, this is intentional. We want the code to be a tool for continuous improvement towards a higher standard. So this is not a legal obligation. This is basically like what best practice would be. Um, so it's interesting to read. So there's a link there, we can go to it. Um, 
it gives you an idea of what, what you should be striving to achieve in terms of best practice. So the code um, supports continuous improvement. So for example, have an external review of the organization. Um, yeah, where, where you have adopted, so if your charity has adopted the code, um, you could publish this as a brief statement in your annual report, for example. So it just has recommended good practice. So things like no trustee should serve more than nine years without good reason. Basically, I think there's this concern that things become a bit too cozy. You know, for example, if you've got the same chief exec, the same chair of trustees have been there for, you know, 15 years, it might be seen as a bit as a bit of a cozy relationship. Whereas if you have that um, turnover, you know, obviously you're, you're getting people coming in perhaps with not the same relationships, but they might be a bit more objective. Um, there's a greater emphasis on the key role of the chair and vice chair in achieving good governance. Actually, when I talk about role descriptions, you could also have a vice chair. Um, so a vice chair, useful if the chair is not able to attend the meeting the vice chair can chair the meeting instead for example um the code recommends the board reviews its performance each year and with larger charities having external evaluation every three years um probably not so relevant to you but larger charities with subsidiary companies um, or larger more oversight for large charities when dealing with subsidiary companies um, ideally, things like board should evaluate the charity's impact by measuring and assessing results, outputs, and outcomes. Um, I mean, there are external um, consultants who will do this kind of thing with variable kind of um, variables of um, results. So, it kind of depends on your, in your budget as to whether that's something you can do as an organisation. Um, they also, the code also stresses emphasis on boards involving stakeholders in key decisions and operating with the presumption of openness. Um, so yeah, stakeholders might be the council, your beneficiaries, other statutory agencies, other, other organizations you work with. Um, so the code has various principles. So. Principle one, organizational purpose, um, that the board should be clear about the charity's aims and this ensures they are being delivered effectively and um, sustainably. This is basically relating to charities um, existing to fulfill, it, fulfill their charitable purposes, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and the code is saying trustees have a responsibility to understand the environment in which the charity is operating. Um, and ideally, the board can demonstrate the charity is effective in achieving its purposes um, and outcomes. So they're recommending things like periodic review of your charitable purposes. As, as I said, you need to make sure your charitable purposes align with what you're actually doing. Um, because under the law, you, you can only actually do, you're only actually allowed to do what you're, is in, the, in, in your charitable purposes. Um, so, and it's a good idea to update your governing document on a fairly regular basis anyway, just to, just to make it um, stay relevant. So it might be every, you know, five to 10 years perhaps. Um, so board should ideally um, be clear about things like outputs, outcomes, and impacts, and how to evaluate them. Uh, regularly reviewing sustainability of income sources and the business model. Um, the board considers benefits and risks of partnerships. Um, obviously, there's a lot of emphasis nowadays on partnership working, which can be very beneficial in terms of increasing. Um, the scale of these operations or projects, getting more funding in, um, but trustees also have to consider the potential risks of those kind of um, uh, partnerships as well. 
it's also the code also asks boards to look at the recognize broader responsibilities towards communities um, society and environment the second principle is leadership um, so about adopting appropriate strategy for delivering aims of the organization. So things like the chair providing leadership to the board. Um, as I said, having things like role descriptions. Um, the board should recognize, respect, and welcome diverse and conflicting trustee views. So there can be a danger where you have a, one particular trustee, for example, or perhaps more, who is a dominating personality, um, and they can tend to uh, dominate the conversation. Um, and quieter people are not going to get their have their voice heard. So that's something you potentially need to be aware of in, in board meetings. Um, board provides constructive challenge to the organization. Trustees give sufficient time uh, to prepare for meetings. As I said, the key, key part of that is making sure that trustees have enough time to read all the documents. When trustees have other roles, they're clear always about the capacity in which they're acting and to whom they report. So that kind of relates to conflicts of interest, being clear about potential conflicts of interest and trustees not taking you know, decisions where there is a conflict of interest. So another principle, the code talks about integrity. So being aware of um, the charity's reputation. Principle four, decision-making, uh, risk and control. Or the principle should be that boards make sure decision-making processes are informed, rigorous, timely, um, and with effective delegation with um, effective risk assessment management system. So it's a good idea to have an, um, an annual risk assessment to identify key risks over the sort of next 12 months. Um, if you need any help with that, we can help you in terms of giving a template risk assessment. It's also talking about delegation. So you know, being clear on what can be delegated to staff or their people who are responsible for day-to-day -day activities and what should be, what decisions should be taken by the board, because I said earlier, the board of trustees is not there to make day-to-day decision-making processes. That's, uh, you know, the board not only meet typically, like I said, six times a year. So it's, it's, it's there to make key decisions, longer-term decisions rather than day-to-day -day decisions. Uh, what it says here, yeah, strategy and performance, not operate, not day to day operational matters. So, yeah, as I said, review of matters reserved to the board, what's delegated. Um, board regularly reviews key policies and procedures. Um, so it's a good idea with your policies to set up a kind of um, spreadsheet with when they were last reviewed so that you can be aware when they need to be reviewed next. As I said, the Charity Commission recommends a safeguarding policy is updated on an annual basis. So you might want to put in you know, that the safeguarding policy might be reviewed every, every February board meeting, for example. Um, but other other policies you might want to you know, have reviewed on perhaps a three yearly basis. Um, so you need to keep track of when a policy is up for um, review. When you apply to grant funders, they might commonly ask for, oh, can you send me your, um, for example, safeguarding policy and the date it was last reviewed by the Board of Trustees. 
Um, so it could be important for your grant funding applications to be aware of when a particular policy was last updated. Um, and it's also good practice to you know, because uh, the environment changes, legal requirements change. Um, so policies need to be updated to reflect um, changes in the um, legal environment and also the um, regulatory requirements. And obviously, if you need any support in terms of updating policies, you can just get in touch with us. Um, another thing to talk about, so performance monitoring, um, the board just needs to make sure the structure is in place for holding staff to account, um, benchmarking with other organisations. So if there are other organisations, charities doing similar work, how does it come, how do you compare? As I've just said, your risk management, good idea to have things like risk and your risk review. You might want to think about things like an audit committee, um, making sure things like the chair has recent and relevant financial experience. So yeah, I mean, another thing to do, think about is like subcommittees, um, depending how large your board is, you might want to think about subcommittees and policy, subcommittees for finance. Um, so that way you might want to have like a, a smaller group number of trustees who can meet to look at a particular issue away from the um, official board meetings. That's something else you can think about. So the principle five of the code is board effectiveness. Um, board should work as effective teams. So things like rigorous approach needed to trustee recruitment, performance and development. So you might want to think about the performance and development of trustees. Um, there are, I'm trying to recall now, but there are certain organizations you can sign up to which offer training to trustees. We provide training, obviously all that, all the training we provide is also available to trustees. Um, and I'll send you some information after as well about other training opportunities available for trustees, but that's something else, yeah, you might want to think about is how trustees skills are being developed. So also, yeah, looking at things like the board's culture, um, accepting and resolving challenges, different views, like I said, making sure the board isn't dominated by a certain number of you know, one person or small number of people. All trustees have appropriate skills and knowledge of the charity. So, you know, principle five, board meets as often as needed to be effective. So this should be in your constitution, in your governing document, how many board meetings a year. Like I said, typically it could be six, sometimes it might be four, could be more. Uh, yeah, important that the chair plans the board's program of work and meetings, um, obviously to ensure things like maximum number of trustees can attend. Um, trustees have the information they need to be able to make well-considered decisions um, you know think about how long your board meeting might be i think our board meetings are like two hours um, you need to give boards enough time to consider all the key decisions um, as i said you know you might want to look at the vice chair board might want to look at also its own um, effectiveness How many people you have on the board, again, should be in your governing document. Um, sort of minimum, I forget what the Charity Commission states, but it can be minimum, I think, five. I think grant funders say at least three. I say should be in your governing document, but minimum and maximum is. Um, so yeah, as I said earlier, should have a pro trans transparent process and how uh, trustees are appointed, uh, have regular skills audit, have perhaps fixed trustee terms. So you don't want to have people trust um, trustees in, in the role too long. 
if you have a wider membership, how the wider membership is going to be involved. Um, principle six is diversity. So this particular issue for charities, because there is a tendency for trustees to be older, to be perhaps more white, middle class, so they're not necessarily reflecting the diversity of London or the diversity of the people the charity supports. But you know, this is a constant ongoing issue. I think all, trust, all trustees are facing that, you know, you're trying to get younger, more diverse people involved, but they're obviously, obviously tend to be busier. And I think quite often retired people, so they tend to have more time available to be trustees. Um, so they're recommending things like, you know, look at, reflect on the diversity of the board. Um, how can you remove, reduce, or prevent obstacles to people becoming trustees? Uh, look at how you can make meetings more accessible, how you can attract diverse pool of candidates. Like I said, you can always use us in the volunteer centre to when you're recruiting new trustees. Um, principle seven, openness, accountability. Um, the board should lead the organisation of being transparent and accountable. So, um, yeah, I mean, you can read, you can get a link to the code um, to go through in more detail if you want to. Ian, um, yeah. will you be sending us this slide? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, also, how do we look for trustees uh, with a bit of a uh, trust, with a bit of a experience I'm looking for? Yeah, like I said, we can help you recruit trustees. Um, yeah, please, we are looking can... for, we are looking Sorry? for something. Uh, Sharanjit, um, I feel there's one, one more, from my opinion, there's one more thing that an organization should look at, and that is um, setting a trustee which has lived experience of the project that you're offering. So uh, also, you know, the borough that you are in, a representative, a person who is a representative of the population that that really helps in, you know, your beneficiaries uh, relating to you as well as you providing the right services for them. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's something you should look for in a trustee. Um, I we are covering both barrels, Elite and Hansel. So you would be able to interact, you would be interacting with people, you know, with like-minded objectives. Those would be the ones you should be looking at to try and engage and get them onto your trustee board. Yeah, Not just right. anyone. And also your skill assessment and your skill audit will help you. So uh, where do I find that? Yeah, I mean, we can send you a template skills audit. Um, yeah, but we are also, uh, where do we find somebody likewise? Well, you, know, you, have to, you have to recruit trustees. You know, it's, a char it's a situation, it's a problem all charities face in terms of finding good trustees. Um, I'm just quickly going to go and finish up because we're getting towards, uh, I think we've got one over the hour. Um, in terms of trustee liability, so just be aware the Charity Commission uh, takes action against trustees on a very rare basis. Um, personal liability gen only generally arises if the failure to discharge duties actually causes loss to the charity or improper gain to the trustee. Um, I mean, there have been some outrageous examples where the Charity Commission has taken um, action. I think someone was like taking hundreds of thousands of pounds out of, out of a charity, for example. Um, yeah, so the Learning Act where a trustee has acted dishonestly or recklessly. Um, it does depend on your legal structure of your charity. If your charity is incorporated, so if it's a charitable incorporated organisation, for example, um, the personal liability of the, of the trustee will be limited to situations in which you have acted wrongfully or fraudulently. Um, but if you are unincorporated, so for example, if you're just an unincorporated charitable organisation, um, the personal liability could be unlimited. So that's why it's a good idea 
um, especially if you start entering into contracts um, to become a CIO, um, because that incorporated status uh, reduces liability for trustees. Obviously, we can help you become registered CIO if, um, if you want that support. Um, incorporation protects trustees from liability for third party debt, but not breach of trust. Um, Cases where trustees are sued for loss from breach of trust are rare, um, and becoming more frequent. So basically, yeah, in the general advice, become incorporated with an extra level of protection. Um, yeah, if you do have staff, be aware employment claim could be one of the largest liabilities which a charity could face. Um, as I said before, if you do have trustees and members, be clear who the members are, if they are different to the trustees. Members have certain rights, but they don't have the same um, obligations as a, as a trustee. If you have a situation where the trustees are members of this as well, um, be clear when they're making a decision as a trustee or when they're making a decision as members. Um, insurance. So might be worth looking at your copies of the charities insurance policies. Um, what limitations are there in the amount that will be paid to a valid claim? Um, be aware of loopholes. Are the trustees themselves insured? Again, another benefit of being incorporated. Um, if you own or lease property, make sure you understand the key terms of the lease, including the rent, your ability to terminate, liability if we are in tear, and insurance obligations. So as I said, good links, charity governance code, charity commission booklets, the central trustee, finding new trustees. Charity commission has a huge amount of information there. Sometimes I think people have difficulty navigating the, um, navigating the, all information. I'll send you those links afterwards. And um, yeah, get in touch with us for any um, further support. Anybody got any um, questions? Yes. Uh, I we are looking for more trustees. Um, I just had a comment, um, really, Ian, um, about Neoka's uh, follow-up on Neoka's comment about trustees being coming from within the organisation. I think it's really important. Um, I mean, sometimes they can be brought in, I've, in my experience, because of their particular skill set. For example, our IT, digital. Um, but I mean, with our organisation, um, dyslexia is, if you, if you don't know anything about dyslexia, then, and you're on our, in, within our organisation, it's, it's quite, would be quite difficult to, to be able to offer anything, um, apart from a specific skill set. Um, so I just wanted to add that, uh, because, um, Tranjit was, was asking about getting hold of trustees. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, and to say thank you, uh, it was uh, very in depth and uh, I'll look forward to having a look at the slides again. So, yeah, I mean, there is a huge amount of information out there. Um, and I think, um, yeah, the trustees are, are key to organisations uh, effectiveness because there's a lot of um, responsibilities um, lie with them, yeah. So if you can get um, good trustees and ensure they know how to follow all the best practice I've sort of gone through, that should help you um, run your organization as effectively as possible. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm also trying to do, try to find the trustees within the organization but it's very hard because everybody going through a really bad patch at the time, at the moment. And it's also coming to the end of the year. 
maybe I think in the beginning of the year, people will be looking forward to do something for the rest of the year. That will be the better time to find the trustees. But thank you very much for your advice. I am. I was thinking about it already. There is also something but to what, what we can do. Sorry. So reach volunteering <laughs> where you can um, post your um, voluntary your trustee uh, vacancies. I need somebody with the digital skills to do this sort of work. Even if you have a, a, a kind of a job description, you've identified your skill set, you've identified the type of person you want. That. If, if you that. put it out, we're, we're happy to put it in our newsletter and on our website. Uh, share those details with us uh, uh -huh. because that, that's how we could support you. We can't really look for a trustee for you. That's something that you would be able to identify and recruit. That's, you know, for I mean, you to you decide you. what you... If you send us those two ways, if you send us a role, if you send us an advert, you can put that in our e-news um, on our website. You can also go to our volunteer centre with your role description saying what you want the trustee to do, what skills you want. And then we can yeah, I, I will definitely your volunteer centre as well. Sharanji, that connected you with Parul from our volunteer centre. She said she would support you to get in touch with her. Uh, okay. I don't know if uh, you have... Uh, yeah, okay. I remember because at the moment I'm working everything myself and uh, yeah. the email helps for money. I'll definitely make a note and uh, write back to her. Thank you. Uh, I've put in a little link on the chat. If uh, everyone, before you leave the session, uh, please give us your feedback to the session. Help us bring in uh, you know more relevant information to you as per what you require. So, yeah, Salma, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I've just got a few questions, please. Um, thank you for the, it was been a very informative workshop. Um, so my question, um, I've got the first one is that, um, can a term of reference be classified as a constitution or are they two separate documents? I mean, what kind of, what, what, what legal structure do you have? Uh, CIO. So I have a constitution, but I'm just wondering that the, the terms of reference is a bit more in depth in terms of breaking the, the task down, identifying the roles and responsibility, whereas constitution just gives you a, a breakdown of what the charity, it, it, who the charity is and what they're doing, what their aims and objectives are and things like that. So I'm just trying to gauge on a difference because often funders, when they are requesting for a constitution, um, um, because I have both, you know, so it's, I'm just trying to think, can one do the, the job or does one have to have both of them or not? No, I mean, the key document is your constitution. That's your that's governing it. document. That's your legal governing document. That's the, that's the document that's on the Charity Commission. That's, what the, that's the document grant funders will, will want to see. Um, when you say terms of reference, yeah, I'm not quite sure, you know, what that is. And I don't think in, it doesn't really have any legal status in terms of you being a charity. You know, if you, as a charity, yeah, I say the, the constitution, that is your key document. That is what you need to stick to. That says what you can and can't do under the law. That should have all your, um, like I said, that you're basically your, the rule book of what you should do, um, the, the process and procedures you should follow. Yeah, so, that, so what, I, what I mean by that is that because I've done this for another charity in the past, so that's why I'm trying to, I'm trying to simplify my own charity, basically. What that relates to is like, for instance, like what are your grievances procedures, if there's been a gross misconduct within the charity, and mm -hmm. within those breakdown daily working practices, so should that really be part of the constitution document because it is a working document? I think, I think yeah, you're talking about policies, so I think you need. You also need the policies on top of your constitution. Yeah, yeah. So you need yeah. like um, you know, grievance policy, safeguarding policy. Um, you know, there's like, we can support you in terms of there's a whole number of different policies you need, which go into more detail about the processes of what should um, happen in certain. But those those would be classified as policies rather than policies terms of and method. procedures. I get you. Okay, and the next one, a question I have in is that in terms of submitting accounts. Um, so you've got to submit your annual accounts along with the trustees annual report. How compulsory is the trustees annual report? Because especially if there's a, as a small charity and you haven't reached a specific uh, threshold, I think it's uh, 25,000 income. If you haven't reached to that mark, then do you have to submit the trustees annual report? 
Yeah, I mean, I can double check that. I think I think you do an annual annual return at the same time within ten months of the previous financial year. So that would be yeah. last financial year ended the thirty first of March. So that would go at the end of January. And the charity commission, I think, it should have sent you a reminder. But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the, I think the the size that relates to whether you think you need like a full audit, um, which sort of relates to the size of the organisation. But I think I can double check and get in touch with you. But I think. Yeah, even if you blow that 25, I think you still have to submit the, the trustees and your report, which basically says like what you've done, sort of activities over the past year with your basic, um, if it's not a full kind of um, audit with accounts, then it might just need a basic balance sheet or something. Um, yeah, but, uh, yeah. Guys, I'll look into that and get back to you. Yes, please. That would be really helpful. Only because, I mean, through my research, I've noticed few charities um, you know, they've just put on their uh, account section on the Charity Commission website that not required. And, and we're far less than that. So I was just, just out of curiosity, I'm asking that question, because if it's not required, because you're below the 25,000, then, you know, I, I mean, I've definitely submitted my annual, uh, the, the trustees annual report uh, in, you know, and together with the accounts, it was just the, the question was out of curiosity, but if you can come back with, with the answer. Yeah, I'll double check that. Thank, thank you. And uh, final two questions. So uh, we as trustees um, basically deliver trainings in, with regards to a trustee being paid because one of my lead trainer, uh, who's also a, tr a trustee, but because we because we're such a small charity and financially, as I explained to you before in the past, that we've had huge issues with regards to COVID, and and now we're just picking ourselves up. Our trustees for for that particular trustee, she doesn't get paid. So if she did now, uh, if she was to in the future, in terms of moving forward of what, after today's workshop, what would be the capacity? It would be a just simple trustee getting paid for the skills that she has delivered uh, to the to the clients. Um, that would that is that how it would work, or is it a specific so be, title? They can't be paid as a trustee. Have you got the CIO? I think you need to check your constitution because. With the Charity Commission CIO template, it does have a ready-made clause in there about charity, um, about trustees being paid mm -hmm. or services other than being a trustee. So check the check the clause in the constitution just to double check what it says, and obviously you can get in touch with me with more okay. support. Um, but yeah, there definitely is a clause in the in the CIO template constitution, standard constitution from the Charity Commission, which does cover that issue. Okay, and and regarding final question regarding safeguarding, um, because all, majority of our workshops are are online, um, do you still have to have a, a DBS uh, for the trustees because they're not directly um, in contact with? Um, we don't deal with children in any case, but let's say vulnerable adults because we deal with women coming out of prison and things like that. Is that compulsory or that because it's online, so you really shouldn't you shouldn't have to unless you physically are in contact, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it says about it talks about regulated activity. Um, I think uh, even online, there is a particular safeguarding uh, uh, policy you need to have in place. And with regards to DBS, I'm not really sure, but we can get you in touch with our local DBS uh, support officer. But uh, uh, to my understanding, you would need to because information would be shared, you know, of that vulnerable adult, even if it's not in person. Yeah, uh, Heather, you want to I'm, add to that? I'm a tutor for Ealing Council uh, in another capacity, uh, not a trustee there, um, and we we have to do uh, we have to do the safeguarding training every year, and we have to all be DBS. So providing a service even online and most of Ealing Council's teaching since COVID has just gone online. Um, so it's not only about physical um, safeguarding, it's about online safeguarding. Thank and they, you. you need to have an e-safeguarding e, uh, e policy, I believe mm -hmm. now, if you're doing online. Yeah, I, I have the I have the policies. I, I I've got the safeguarding policy, but I was just um, wasn't sure that you know um, for workshops online that would you still be required for the trainer to have the DBS. But I think you've just cleared. I that would up. say most definitely yes. Yeah, 
I mean, Ealing Council, you know, it's a college, adult college, and uh, everybody's DBS and everybody's safeguarded, <laughs> safeguarding the same every year, annually. And we're working with adults. Um, I mean, it's more, uh, it's different with children, but uh, say, same thing. Yes. Again, uh, adults and children use same DBS. Is this at the Mine. highest level, Heather? Yeah, is this enhanced. at the highest enhanced? Okay, enhanced. That, that's Heather. what Ealing Council do. So I guess that's best practice in the borough. I could also I connect. You. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Heather. Uh, I did request. I send you a mess, message in the chat. I request you uh, details. So uh, we will be delivering another project in Ealing. So could I have your details, please, to contact you? Uh, wh why? I can't hear you very well, Sharon G. Um, I sent you, I send you uh, a, a request in the chat box. Um, I just uh, wonder, what, I wonder why you want my details really is because it we're going to deliver a next project in ealing area so if we uh, can uh, what sort uh, of, sorry what sort of project is yours sharon g it'll be online art and craft and uh, healthy cooking sessions okay uh, what i could suggest you do because i am just a tutor for ealing council um if it was a dyslexia related thing I'm a trustee and, and a tutor for them. But if it's to do with delivering um, activities online and you wanted to check, I suggest you you um, you you ring Ealing Council or or use um, the voluntary services to guide you okay. in that respect, if that's okay. That's fine, thank you. And good good luck to you. Thank you, darling. I think I need to go. So it's been really, really yeah, useful. Thanks. So thank Indeed. you, Ian. And Sorry, I have to go in person. I've done Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. Do click the link on uh, the, the chat box and do give us your feedback before you I've, leave. I've and thank yeah, you all for joining us today. I've done it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice thank day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.